Welcome. Happy Monday, everybody. Um, happy almost Monday at noon, uh, March 15th. I'm really excited to welcome people to this Baton Hour, our kickoff event for Public Service Week. Public Service Week at the University of Virginia is a university-wide celebration of service. And it was conceived last year by President Jim Rhyme. And it's a week that I think gives us an opportunity to remember what leadership and public policy are all about. Helping people, reducing suffering, expanding opportunity, improving the lives of others in the world. And I'm really delighted that, that this Baton Hour can, uh, we can have a special panel discussion about public service with four terrific people. Now, maybe it's redundant to say they're four terrific people because they are four Batten graduates, but they're also especially terrific people, according to Joe Rockwell. Um, they are four people who graduated from our BA and MPP programs and are serving the public across the sectors uh, in, in state, federal, international, nonprofit, and educational policy. So I want to thank them for coming back, even if only by Zoom for today's event. Um, once part of the Batten School, always part of the Batten School. We're excited to learn from you today. There'll be lots of opportunity to, for questions. Um, so if, if you have some questions, you can uh, put it into the chat or you can um, hold that for when we go to discussion. But let me uh, turn now to my dear colleague, Steve Hiss, our Batten Career Services Director, who will introduce the alumni and get the program started for today. Thank you very much, Dean Solomon. It's my pleasure to uh, both welcome and introduce uh, these alumni. We were, we were kind of joking before everyone came in that these alums are from the Jill Rockwell era, not the Steve Hiss era, because they all uh, are some of our more distant, if we have more distant alums in the Batten School. But, uh, but, but we have four great panelists with us today. And I'll briefly go you know, kind of through the highlights of their bios, and then we'll turn it back over and, and go from there. First, uh, and I'll go from most distant to most recent, is uh, Dana Lawrence. Uh, Dana is National Deputy Director for Advocacy, Policy Engagement, and Partnerships for Education Reform Now. She earned her BA in 2009 and her MPP in 2010, both from UVA. She was recently named in the Washingtonian Magazine as one of DC's most influential people in education. And some of her other experiences include the DC Public Schools Urban Education Leaders Internship Program, founding interventionists for KIPP New Orleans Leadership Academy Public Charter Schools, Teach for America, special, special education teacher, program manager of the Education Initiatives Program for the Charleston Promise Neighborhood, and deputy director of Students First South Carolina. So Dana, welcome. Next is Aaron Chavitz. Aaron is senior economist in the Office of HIV AIDS at the US Agency for International Development. He earned his BA in 2012 and his MPP in 2013, again, both from UVA. He's been with USAID for nearly eight years. Interestingly enough, he is the former Batten Graduate Council president and served as a TA uh, for your favorite RMDA course. And some of his other experiences include a position with the International Economic Development Council and as a researcher in the politics department. So Aaron, welcome to you. Next is Grace Eckel. Grace is senior budget and policy analysis at the Colorado Governor's Office of State Planning and Budgeting. And she's joining us from Denver where she's under two feet of snow, but uh, she seems to have dug herself out for this event. She earned her BA in Batten's inaugural class of 2014 and completed an MPH from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in 2019. She's a founding member of the Batten Alumni Advisory Board. And some of her other experiences include an associate at PwC and policy and advisory fellow at the city of Baltimore. So Grace, welcome to you. And finally is Preeti Varma. Preeti is Partnership and Volunteer Engagement Manager at America Needs You. She also earned her BA in our inaugural class of 2014 and completed her MA in Social Service Administration from the University of Chicago in 2020, and she's joining us from Chicago. Some of her other experiences include a summer fellowship 
with the DC Public Schools Urban Education Leaders Internship Program, Teach for America, and a graduate position with the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. And Preeti, welcome to you as well. And Dean Solomon, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, well, it's gonna be a great discussion. I'm excited to have you all here. Um, let's dive right in. And I will invite you, each of you, to share with us a little bit about your career path since leaving UVA in Charlottesville. Um, and you know, just talk about from, from the time you were batting to where you are in your current position now. And maybe we'll go in the same order that Steve just introduced you. And I'll start with you, Dana. Sure. Well, thank you all for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here today with fellow Batten uh, faculty, staff, and alumni, and, and uh, the broader university community. Um, it's been a while, as Steve shared, I graduated mine, um, and obviously because of COVID, haven't been able to go back to Charlottesville in a couple years, but I can't wait till things are a little bit back to normal and I'm able to be there in person. Um, but uh, it's also really great to hear that Preeti, uh, one of the other alumni on the call today, is a ULIF alum. Um, and, and thinking back about how I got into the work, um, you know, public service was something that I thought about um, during my undergrad experience and really my internship during Baton solidified my path into education. And it was much, um, I would say, dating back to that internship at DC Public Schools. Ironically, I live in DC and I'm looking at the DC Public Schools office building right now where I interned. Um, so the, the small world, full circle. Um, yeah, I did the internship. At that point, it was um, something that you could apply to as an undergrad or as a grad student. So because I was in Baton, I was put in the grad student cohort um, and was really with a bunch of law students um, and was one of the only public policy uh, fellows in the program at the time. But it was a really transformational experience for me. Um, growing up, I actually, you know, I'm an immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago. My parents came to this country so that I could be the first in our family to go to college um, and had a great education in Northern Virginia at Fairfax County Public Schools and did not realize the extreme disparities that were happening right across the Potomac um, in DC for my neighbors there. Um, that internship really opened my eyes to the inequity in education um, and me realizing that, you know, your school is going to be something that um, can really lift you out of your, your current circumstance, especially for folks like me who were low income um, and needed a pathway out of, out of poverty, quite frankly. Um, so uh, being, being exposed to that experience, I was able to link up and do a, uh, my, my thesis project with DC Public Schools as my client. So my internship transferred on to that. Um, even further developed um, and uh, went on to do Teach for America at that point and wanted to be able to get firsthand experience in the classroom. So I applied to a number of different programs uh, to be able to be certified and teach. Um, ended up being selected to open a, a charter school in, uh, in New Orleans at the time. That was about five years after Katrina um, and was a really high need area. I also signed up to be a special educator. That was the office I worked in at DC Public Schools and felt extremely committed to you know, those students in particular who um, weren't being served equitably at DCPS. And I wanted to be able to take what I learned about the law and the you know, IDEA um, and really transfer that into my, my time with kids in New Orleans. Um, so that was, uh, was something that I you know, really was, was glad to be able to have done. I taught for three years total in New Orleans and in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and at that point felt like my impact was limited in the classroom, um, got really connected to my students, but continued to be uh, basically pushed out of the classroom at the end of the year because of my lack of experience. And if there was a shortcut or a budget shortfall, you know, the, the most, the least experienced educators, despite our impact with our kids would be the first to leave. So at that point I got into um, a more policy focused role at a nonprofit where we were able to reward education um, who are doing uh, you know really well with their students who are going above and beyond and 
and really seeing the, the disparity in pay and things like that, um, I knew that the, the, there was a lot of work to do, quite frankly, in the policy space. Um, I ended up joining Students First, um, which Michelle Ree, who was the chancellor at DC Public Schools at the time of my internship, founded after she left um, to really advocate for similar types of policies um, that would be equitable and, and with the end game of, of ensuring that all kids have access to a high quality public school. Um, so I ended up organizing in South Carolina as an educator um, and due to a variety of reasons, somehow got into lobbying. That was the last thing I was thinking about, you know, growing up in DC, I never interned on the Hill or thought about doing uh, political work, um, but that was just the card that's, the cards that were dealt. And I thought, how am I gonna be able to influence, you know, these, these Southern lawmakers who I don't really identify with at all? Turns out they needed to do for kids in the state and, and realize the gravity of the issues and, uh, was more successful than I thought I would be. Um, we were able to work on closing a couple of lawsuits uh, for students in South Carolina and then ended with the Every Student Succeeds Act being passed at the federal level. President Obama signed that into law right before um, the end of his term and uh, states were able to set up their own plans. And that's what I was able to work on um, prior to eventually leaving South Carolina and moving up to DC about four years ago. Um, and now I work in a, in a space at the federal level doing the same type of work, um, but it's very, very different. I would love to get into more about, you know, the differences about advocating on the state level versus the federal level. Um, but that's a little bit about me and my path and into education, so. Fantastic, thank you, Dana. Um, so moving from education policy now to international development, let me invite Aaron to talk about his uh, path from Baton to the present. Sure, thanks Dean Salman. Again, thanks to all the professors and staff here and uh, the current students and prospective students uh, just taking the time to, to listen this week. Um, so much like Dana, I actually uh, went to school here in Fairfax County as well. Um, and was constantly reminded by my parents that, you know, not everybody had the same access to great education as well. And, you know, understanding that and constantly being reminded uh, was definitely a passion of mine to get into public service in some way or another. Um, and so, you know, starting uh, at UVA, tried to every, every single semester I was volunteering at Madison House and figuring out ways in which I could be giving back to the community. And, uh, I spent five years working in Madison House, uh, mostly with AHIP, the uh, Albemarle Housing Improvement Program, and uh, led that up in my uh, fifth year in Baton. Uh, as, uh, yeah, had that, headed that up. And with that kind of focus, that was very uh, local focused, uh, but my coursework uh, in economics and foreign affairs made me think kind of big picture. I wanted to be in, in the international space uh, and wanted to do Peace Corps uh, early on and then heard about this great school called Batten and was like, ah, oh, this is a great stepping stone. Uh, and in doing so, kind of moved, moved from wanting to do work in the international space to local uh, and tie that back in. Uh, my APP, my thesis project was uh, working with Charlottesville uh, Housing uh, and trying to create affordable housing in DC or in, in Charlottesville and was thinking from there, you know, I really wanted to be working for local government, uh, whether it's uh, local or city government. And most of my applications when I started applying to uh, find jobs was definitely domestic focused and, and working in um, urban planning and um, in housing related fields. And just kind of on a whim was thought maybe I should apply to USAID and ended up landing a, a, a fellowship there. And, you know, I've been there the last eight years. Uh, and so for those of you looking, you know, when you're getting out of Baton, uh, fellowships and internships are a great way to kind of start out your careers to get a sense of what the organizations are like, and then kind of being able to position that into uh, creating a network for yourself. Uh, and so I started off working there in the Office of Economic Policy, which I, you know, it was a great fit for me. It combined policy and uh, international development and being able to apply all of my econ coursework, uh, doing uh, macro briefers and benefit cost analysis um, uh, and, and these growth diagnostics, uh, which were incredibly fascinating. Uh, and through that, I got to work with the agency's chief economist. So 
position, going from that kind of fellowship into a full-time position, I started working for the agency's chief economist uh, and working with him full-time. And that was such a great experience. And really, I spent a lot of time working on the Ebola epidemic and USAID's involvement there uh, from an economic perspective, um, which was fascinating. And then kind of get, jumping into coronavirus is interesting, you know, having that background working with uh, Ebola. Uh, so uh, six years ago now, so I, I transitioned from uh, working under the chief economist to moving over to the office of HIV AIDS at USAID. So didn't have an, a, a background in health, uh, but they were looking for folks who had experience in policy and had strong uh, analytic skill sets. They were looking to build up um, a, a team that had strong analytic skills and so that uh, fit my needs. And so uh, over the past five or six years, you know, I've helped carve out a space for data analytics in PEPFAR. So it's the President's Emergency Plans for Age Relief, which has tons and tons of uh, uh, measurement and evaluation data. Uh, and we've really positioned it to a federal uh, program interagency. We work with CDC, DOD, uh, Peace Corps, HRSA, SAMHSA, and, and USAID and State Department to bring together all of this data and try to target hotspots of the epidemic and, and uh, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also Asia and Central America. Um, and in doing so, you know, our team or this whole office is largely, you know, a lot of doctors, a lot of people with their MPHs, uh, but in the last six years, it's become a lot of MPPs as well, uh, just because that they it is, you know, such a, uh, sought after degree now that has this strong skill set that you can kind of position yourself and it's it's all about problem solving. Um, so that's been a, a true asset is having this uh, background in this degree. Um, and so I, you know, I've gotten to work there, built up a, a small team of data scientists uh, that work under me uh, and get to travel frequently and, until COVID uh, in Malawi and Tanzania frequently, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Ethiopia. Um, so it's been a, a great experience getting to, you know, help people um, through working with data and, and being able to work with our country teams in place, both the local staff and foreign service officers to try to end this, this epidemic. Fantastic. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I imagine the uh, international development life by Zoom is a very different experience of uh, M&E work and, and feeling connected to, to the this problems you're solving. Appreciate your, your, your perspective. Um, let's now turn back to, I think, domestic issues and look at state budgeting with Grace, who's in Colorado. Thank you. It's really wonderful to have the opportunity to join you all and, like others, wish that we could be back on grounds um, at the Batten School, but Zoom will have to do for now. Um, so similar to Dana and Aaron, I would say that my interest in public policy initially sparked growing up um, both overseas in post-war Croatia and then in rural Southwest Virginia, um, where in both places saw the impact of um, food insecurity, lack of access to healthcare and um, racism and poverty on the communities. Um, but it really wasn't until joining the Batten School, which conveniently um, the, uh, uh, undergraduate program emerged right as I was looking for my um, degree. Um, but it wasn't until joining Batten that I realized kind of what my spark and um, career passion is, which is to use public policy to address and um, resolve some of these social and environmental determinants that result in health and um, education inequities. Um, so while at the Batten School, I focused most of my coursework on health policy, including working as a research assistant with Dr. Ray Shapak. Um, and in that time, I was first introduced to the use of data and evidence in shaping um, state and local leaders' decisions. Following graduation, I joined PricewaterhouseCoopers as a health industries consultant, and I worked there for four years, both um, in DC and then in Denver. Um, and in this role, I assisted health organizations, both insurers and providers strategically reimagine their role in healthcare 
This was shortly following the passage of the Affordable Care Act. So many um, private organizations were wanting to transition from the traditional focus on individual fee-for-service care to a more upstream approach on um, addressing those social and environmental determinants of health in their community. Um, so that was the first time that I was really introduced to um, the private sector advancing social good. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting space for um, public policy leaders to focus as well. Um, but ultimately I wanted to shift from kind of individual consulting work at um, one organization at a time to addressing and solving um, issues from a systems level perspective. So I returned to Johns Hopkins to complete my master's of public health with a concentration in health policy. While I was in grad school, I worked as a fellow for a Baltimore city councilman um, and really enjoyed applying a lot of my work to local government. Um, and then I also focused my research on policy solutions for social determinants of health, specifically affordable housing for health. Um, following grad school, I joined um, the Colorado Governor Jared Polis's office. Um, so I'm a senior budget and policy analyst in the governor's budget office, which is similar to OMB at the federal level. Um, and in this role, I transitioned from where my career had previously been focused on healthcare to early childhood and K-12 education. Um, and as Aaron said, you know, they were less interested in the subject matter expertise in these um, areas, but more the critical thinking skills, the ability to um, address challenging problems and, um, and use evidence to inform budget and policy decisions. So in this role, I manage the state's $6 billion K-12 and early childhood education budget, um, while also advising the governor on policy and budget strategies to advance his top priorities, including establishing universal preschool. Um, if you've taken uh, Ray's class in budgeting, you'll know that policy and budget go hand in hand, so that you really um, can't do one without the other. And then in addition, since last March, I've also been leading our state's COVID response for K-12 and childcare, um, which has involved determining strategic allocation of the state's federal stimulus awards um, and really aiming to keep equity at the center of our decision process, ensuring that um, most support goes to child care providers, low income families, and the communities most impacted by the crisis. Um, so it's it's been a really wonderful journey since Batten, and I truly credit the foundation for my profession in the Batten coursework and experiences that we had um, while at UVA. Fantastic. Thank you, Grace. Great to hear that. So America needs you. At least that's what Preeti's going to tell us something about. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everyone, for um, you know inviting me to this panel, and it's really great from uh, my fellow alumni um, and all the you know amazing work you all are doing right now. Um, so, current I am the volunteer engagement manager at America Needs You. Uh, we say A and Y um, as staff, but our mission is uh, focused on economic mobility for first generation college students. So. Um, I work right now in the develop space uh, when it comes to corporate sponsorships, uh, volunteerism, as well as um, individual giving, and um, specifically in you know in the college career uh, career space as well in higher ed. Uh, and it's crazy to think you know when I was at UVA, the my ULIP internship before my fourth year of college really catalyzed my my career um, into what I'm doing right now. So, um, you know, Batten was a very transformative time. Um, and, you know, the internship between third and fourth year um, was also a very impactful one. Um, kind of a little bit about my kind of how I ended up at a &Y and kind of what I'm doing right now. At UVA, I was always, you know, interested in volunteerism, uh, mentorship and education. 
before applying to the undergrad program, I was actually a, um, 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 a WGS major before it was called SWAG, Studies of Women and Gender. Um, so I was a, WG, a WGS major, and then I applied to uh, the Batten School. So it was really great because I was able to uh, kind of find the theoretical skills to kind of the hard policy skills in Batten. Um, and at UVA, I was very involved with the Women's Center. I was um, um, a mentor and a facilitator with the, the Young Women's Leadership Program, the program that works with uh, young, young girls in middle school um, in the city of Chicago. Um, my good friend and I uh, started at that time, I think it was 2011, Asha for Education, which focused on education in India. And we also kind of volunteered in the city of Charlottesville. Um, and it was it was a really great experience. I wanted to work hands on within you know the city, um, you know within the classroom with with youth that were you know dealing with different inequities um, and, and needed that support. Um, and that kind of led me to my internship um, actually with um, Senator Tim Kaine. At that time, he was a freshman senator. He was actually in the basement of the Senate building uh, for a few months, which was. An interesting experience. Uh, and then my EULA position. So I had the privilege of working in Tim Kaine's office and transitioning to DC Public Schools. Uh, I, even though it was, it was such an awesome experience working at Capitol Hill, sitting in like committee hearings, I felt there was a disconnect um, between policy decisions, kind of federal policymakers, and then constituents, right? The people who are truly affected by policies and programs at that state and local level. And so I was really excited to transition my internship um, with DC Public Schools. It was um, the post Michelle Re era. So a lot of the initiatives, programs and policies were, uh, for, were being implemented when I was that interim. And then I was in the, the, the um, Center of College and Career Readiness, where I was close working with different counselors in different high schools at that time. And you know, since that experience, I, I decided to apply to Teach for America. I ended up in Chicago, which worked out. My family's originally from Chicago. Um, and I, I grew up in Northern Virginia, some other uh, panelists, um, but I was so excited to go back to the city where you know, my family was originally from. But, I, I worked um, on the West side. I was also in special education um, and I had a difficult time in the classroom. I, 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 I kind of like went in, I thought, hey, I'm gonna put in my two to four years and Teach for America, apply to law school, um, you know, do everything. And I decided my path really changed. And I realized the classroom was not for me. I was in a, um, in a, cat in a charter network that, was not functioning well at all. And we ended up, my school that I was at ended up shutting. So we, um, they essentially gave you an option, either leave TFA or tr switch to a different school. Um, and I decided, you know, this was not for me. I felt like I could make a better impact kind of in a, in a different space. So I um, kind of left the classroom and decided to work in the nonprofit space. So after, for the past six years, um, I, I've worked in both programming as well as in development. Now recently COVID kind of switched my career trajectory and now I'm actually in development and fundraising. Um, but over those years, you know, I worked at a local Chicago nonprofit where I was implementing um, both middle school and high school programs in Chicago public schools, um, specifically with sports-based youth development. So the goal was how to support our students not in the classroom, right? Like in order for a student to get to the classroom and to be successful, there's so many things that need to happen. For th you know, there has to be things that address food insecurity, getting from point A to point B, transportation, safety. Um, if for a high school student coming from the south side all the way to north side, if he or she um, is in a selective enrollment, we have to think about transportation when Chicago is one of the most segregated cities how are they going to get, they're going to be spending an hour and a half to three morning. So simply like transportation, housing. Um, so those are the things that I was really interested in. And I wanted to think about um, how can we support students in social emotional space, as well as an extracurricular space, um, so they can be successful in the classroom. So for a while, I 
Um, I built out the high school leadership program um, where you know we worked with students, uh, prepare for college, apply to college, and now you know persist through college. Um, and during that time, I decided to go to graduate school. I think I, I was three years out of Baton. I was ready for grad school. I was excited to kind of apply my skill set and my experience to the classroom. Um, and I and I decided to go to the school work route. Um, I was kind of going back and forth between an MPP um, at the Harris School of Public Policy at U Chicago and then the School of Social uh, Social Service Administration. I decided to go the SSA route because it was a combination of social work and social policy. Because um, you know, I thought I had you know I I built those. Uh, I built policy skills in Baton that I was already using at that point. I felt, you know, all the skills I, I built, I was still applying to in my career a few years out. But I really wanted to understand the kind of the clinical side as well as that nonprofit side, um, all the way to kind of the higher level policy side. So I decided to go the SSA route during my time in graduate school. Um, I worked at a, I was also, I was working full time. <laughs> I was working full time. In the nonprofit, I was um, interning both at um, over the course of three years, interning at Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, in Chicago in the Chicago Regional Office, and then also a college um, access nonprofit, uh, college access workforce development nonprofit that worked with high school seniors and placed them in jobs and internships with the city, and also prepared them to apply to college. Um, and then that kind of you know over that time I. Again, your, your, my path changed. I thought I was going to work for the federal government. I decided that was not for me. I, um, I wanted the flexibility and the creativity that um, comes with working in a nonprofit. I think nonprofits have to function with very little human and financial capital, and it requires you to be very creative and wear multiple hats. You know, one second I am talking to a corporate sponsor, the next second I'm doing a case, um, a case support you know, conversation with a student who was deeply, whose family was affected in COVID, during COVID. So I'm, I was able to bounce kind of wear these multiple hats and that's what I, you know, really wanted. So um, in the middle of, you know, since COVID started, um, I had been with America Needs You, again, focusing on first generation college students coming from low income background backgrounds. Um, they were very, you know, our students were hit by COVID, our families lost wages, um, safety and health was a huge priority last year, um, but also all of our students were full-time college, you know, in college, um, and they were persisting through college, getting your internships, um, and so I was working in the programming space, making sure students were supported, um, they were connected with professionals, um, it was, it's, you know, really awesome to see the, the impact that a lot of nonprofits had in Chicago, um, our college students, despite COVID, you know, we're getting internships at Goldman, at PwC, at Deloitte, um, and then also supporting their families at the same time. So I was, you know, really excited to see that. And over the past six months, that kind of led me to development, where now um, I really enjoy how different sectors intersect with each other and how I, you know, again, I'm in that role where I'm talking to different companies, um, different foundations, and working to build partnerships um, with A and Y and um, these, you know, external external partners. And yeah, so it's really exciting. Great, thank you, Preeti. So, so one of the things that I, I admire, and as I think about you, how much navigating you've already done in just a few years, each of you. So, I mean, I guess Aaron, you've been in the same institution, but even within the even within USAID, you, you, you've had different uh, different folks focus foci um, on Ebola and HIV. I'm curious, as you've done this navigation um, through education, direct service, state development, different roles, how have you thought about the who you wanna serve, the best mechanisms to serve that population? What roles might exist for you to actually get to serve those people in that way? And, and, and what has been most helpful? Has there been a mentor or someone who's helped you along the way? Have you just gotten lucky at times? How have you thought about kind of the navigation aspect of this early stage of your public service careers? And you know, you don't all have to answer it. I'll, I'll, I'll point to Grace first, um, but uh, feel free to jump in on each other if you want as well. 
Thanks. I, I think that's a really great question. Um, so in terms of who I have thought about serving, um, I've often gravitated towards individuals um, that really need the support the most and often are um, disadvantaged or under-resourced uh, uh, through traditional power structures. Um, and so I think the way that that has um, come to pass and how I serve them, particularly in my current role, is really trying to bring the community into our state level policy decisions, um, particularly in the past year, as we've been navigating COVID, um, governors were really on the front lines and thinking through um, both how to respond immediately to the public health crisis, but also to avoid economic fallout. And that really happens on an individual household basis. So in terms of how to serve, um, we, brought together groups of community organizations and leaders. Um, and I particularly tried to include in those conversations folks that traditionally don't have the loudest voice or aren't um, don't have seats at the table to make sure that all needs were being understood and addressed. Um, but in, in navigating the course of my professional career, um, I've certainly leaned on a number of contacts and resources. Um, and I, I think that, you know, looking both at Batten and then again, when I was doing my MPH, um, I essentially thought of my network as a web and it really only takes a couple of people um, to reach out and say, I'm interested in doing this. Do you have anyone I could talk to? Um, and I think, particularly for current students, you're uh, in such a great position to just have those informal conversations with individuals. Um, really, there doesn't even have to be an, an ask associated with it, um, just more kind of building up those conversations. And then when I would apply to jobs, um, I would reach back out and say, you know, I've applied here. Do you know anyone at this organization? Um, so, I, I certainly see how a number of individuals, um, including Batten professors, have helped me in my career. Um, and I think all of us in navigating our roles certainly would want to reach back and help people along as they're looking, um, particularly for, for roles in, um, in public service and um, anyone who identifies with the desire to serve, I think, um, would love to have a conversation with. Thank you for helping to form our, our, the web for the students on this call as well. Others want to reflect on that question of, of navigation for themselves? Dana, you look like you're about to say something. Yeah, I'm thinking about this one. Um, I, I'm realizing that uh, the, the further you are from the, the group or the constituency that you're seeking to serve, um, the more sometimes convoluted policy can become. Um, and then really thinking about too, policy is only as good as the implementation. And um, without buy-in, without um, really not even just buy-in, but input from the policy making level, um, it makes it it makes it a lot harder if you don't have that. Um, once the bill is pet, uh, things rolling. And so I saw that at the state level very clearly uh, where the timeline between a piece of legislation being passed and it going into effect was much shorter obviously than at the federal level where it takes years sometimes for a bill to be developed and then even longer for it to be implemented. And then folks who are at the federal side don't see what's, um, so the structure of my organization is such that we have eight state chapters. So we are able to do some of that. Um, but for anyone, I guess on this call, one, one piece that I would leave with you is to think about the sector and who you are trying to serve and being able to have firsthand experience, whether it's as an intern, as a fellow, um, you know, 
through some sort of volunteering experience that you can actually have tangible um, experiences with that population and then be able to use that lens. It would be, it's going to be a whole lot more beneficial for you once you get behind the desk and you're on the policy making side of things to see um, the data as people and faces and not just numbers on a spreadsheet. Um, so that's something that we're can we're continually trying to improve. And we've learned a lot of lessons, I think, in the education space, um, in the charter space in particular, um, when you think about who's opening schools and who has access to dollars um, and are they from the community and things like that. And to the second piece in terms of navigating, I think some of it was luck potentially. I think being in a state like South Carolina, it was such a small ecosystem. Um, and it was, a, it was much easier, as I said, to make it, quite frankly, there weren't a ton of education policy experts in the state. And so if you have the, the drive and the ability to go out and make changes, um, in a space, in a, in a smaller community, in a smaller state, you, you can go and make a big impact. And I remember feeling like um, I was kind of a big fish in a small pond. And then I was coming to DC and I was going to be like non-existent <laughs> in terms of the ecosystem that is DC. Um, but really uh, networking is important. I didn't do a whole lot of networking when I first came up here. I was just kind of like head down, let me figure out what is going on. Um, with the Hill and federal policy, which I'm not an expert on. Um, but then over, over time, you know, your work naturally brings you in to coalitions and partnerships. Um, and that ecosystem starts to feel a lot smaller. Um, and then you have to just be really strategic with your time. So I have a two-year-old, almost three. Um, and, you know, that that's a whole nother set of, uh, of challenges when it comes to being able to have a work-life balance. Um, and so being smart about what you really care about and what you can allocate your extra time. If you have even an hour or two in the week, what would make you want to sign up for something further? So I had a networking propositions, if you will, from UVA, from uh, TFA, but I ended up um, really just kind of listening to people that I really trusted in the space and ended up joining an organization uh, called Women in Government Relations that's, um, you know, a national group. We obviously are, you know, in DC, we have a lot of, we had in-person events. Now it's more national because everything's over Zoom and it really links you with women who are doing um, the same type of work that you're doing, but in all sectors um, and to be able to learn from from experts and really you know there's a mentorship program where you can sign up for a mentor or you can sign up to be a mentor and things like that and that that's the niche that I found um, I really wanted to spend extra time on and looking back now I guess it's been about four years since I'm, I've been in DC somehow um, have managed to make a big impact and it just takes time and knowing that you know when I came into this space I was not thinking about how am I going to conquer that you know this federal landscape I was just trying to make small inroads and advance you know little pieces of legislation that I thought positive way you know take time and patience and and really I would say with networking it's genuine authentic connections right you don't want to just like have a bunch of coffees with people and 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 make it kind of more surface level you really want to get to know folks and understand um, what's valuable for them and be able to have a reciprocal relationship and that's how um, you know you don't need a billion mentors you just need like that handful of folks who are really going to have you or back and be thinking about you when an opportunity comes up. So it's not, you know, you just your eyes looking for those opportunities, but it's network that really cares about you and knows what you want to do on a deeper level. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to offer uh, Preeti and Aaron a chance to ask the question if you want as well, but I also want to invite others who have a question. If you want to put your question in the chat after this next set of answers, I'll turn to Steve and Hannah from the Batten staff to uh, field some, some questions. So if you want to think of your questions in the chat, that'd be great. Phoebe, did I see you unmuting yourself there a moment ago? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add and kind of echo what Nina was saying. I think 
this past year, um, you know, with COVID, and it's crazy to think it's been literally one year. <laughs> Uh, but what I realized is that for me, you know, my network, my the relationship I have built, um, I had within my personal and professional lives really matter. Um, you know, I working from home <laughs> for over the past year, I, I built strong relationship with my coworkers um, and my colleagues who are around the country. And I realized, you know, that is that's really important to me. I want to enjoy what I'm doing. And I also want to do mission driven work. Um, you know, right now I'm, I'm also kind of in transition. I'm thinking about my, my future of the next steps. And those are the two, two big things that I've, I've realized that, you know, I want to do mission driven work and relationships really matter in my professional life. And I want that work life balance as well. Um, and I, I think another thing to highlight, um, you know, the, the question was like, who are you serving at the end of the day? Um, for me, you know, I'll be very explicit. Like I want to continue serving at any level, uh, black and brown youth in the city of Chicago who are coming from underserved areas. Um, if that means direct service, if that means working at the city level, state level, um, so be it. Uh, and that was, you know, something that I, I, I think I, I, I really thought about and developed early on in college. Um, and that has just like driven me to kind of the next step. Um, and throughout my, um, you know, similar to grades, now, like you really build that network or web of, you know, uh, of colleagues, of, um, you know, professionals who are, who are, you know, have more experience, who have, you know, are higher up the ladder. Uh, it's really important to kind of build folks from different industries and sectors, especially in education, especially in public policy. Um, there's so many intersecting sectors, so it's important to understand kind of what's happening in the corporate spinning in, you know, um, the state in the governor's office, what's happening at, you know, the foundational level. So I, yeah, I think it's really important to have a, those, those uh, connections across sectors and in, in industries. Anything you'd like to add to that, Aaron, your own navigation? Those are three brilliant answers. I, I don't have much more to add to it. Uh, I can tackle the, the start off the next question. So, so has there been, have you, it's often to navigate a place, a place like USAID, you really do need to have a mentor or someone there who can help you, help you kind of find your way and find, seize those opportunities. Um, has there been a, a mentor that has, has really served you and have you had an opportunity to mentor others in your role? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I think a combination of both internal and external mentors, uh, both people I actually know or people I aspire to kind of live up to be. Um, you know, I maintain relationships with uh, Batten professors and UVA professors that give me a lot of advice, um, and and trying to follow somewhat in their footsteps, I think has been you know huge over the last eight years. Um, and then within USAID, um, you know, I the nice thing about it is. You know, it's, it's somewhere, one of the reasons I have not pursued a PhD is I don't really have a drive for any serving one particular population. And it's nice, I can kind of jump around. Generally, I wanna be in development and international and I can kind of have that space. And I can work with people across education and development and, you know, uh, food security and different things and, and obviously health with malaria and, and HIV and see what these different folks in the different sectors are able to apply. Uh, and I, I find that incredible. And what I've slightly done over the you know past few years as I've kind of been more ingrained in, in HIV is trying to bring some of those uh, experts in those other places into our team um, who have this great exposure and I you know admired their work and I've you know put on trainings with them in the past for larger USAID University uh, events to, to put on um, development trainings and such and brought them onto the team to have those unique experiences because I admire them and, you know, look up to the way they work. And it's been a huge asset. Uh, and I, to me, that's the biggest thing is um, working with people who you admire and who you, you know, it's driven by a passion of them and the overall mission. Great. I, uh, I have, I have a question if that's allowed. And first of all, Aaron, I love seeing your dog in the background, you know, it's great to, Great to see all the animals on Zoom that you get that you get to see. 
Uh, and Aaron, I think it was you that mentioned uh, data analytics and Grace, I think it was you that mentioned Professor Shapak's uh, budgeting class. What are some of the other skills or knowledge that you gained in your Batten coursework that really have helped you either in your current role or in some of your previous roles? Oh man, that's tough, you know, eight years out. Um, it, it all kind of melts together. You know, it's, you know, I think one of the things other than kind of the research methods course and yet you know, obviously the, the APP being able to apply it in IPA courses, um, you know, Professor Converse uh, used to have, and I'm sure still has like a negotiation course. Uh, and that was just fabulous. And, you know, I find that, you know, in a day-to-day -day, uh, environment of trying to negotiate uh, with other sectors or folks at different agencies, not, you know, trying to do anything um, harmful or things, but just trying to figure out how do we get the, the most out of this relationship and how do we advance these things uh, through emails, through discussions and figuring out what to give. Uh, this ne the negotiation class was uh, one of the most formative and something I didn't really think about uh, before Batten. Um, uh, Gosh, yeah, that's that's the first one that's coming out. I would have said that the research methods courses, uh, other than that. Yeah, so for me, um, I, I, you know, I was in all these courses under in undergrad, um, but I don't consider myself a hard data person. Um, you would you have to go to, you know, Dana, Grace or Aaron for that. But um, for me, while I was in Batten, I really enjoyed, and I think I learned from being in a group of students who all came from different backgrounds and disciplines. So at the end of the day, you know, we are, are trying to achieve a, you know, make a policy decision, for example, or, or whatever is going to um, make society equitable, just, um, and, you know, people happy. So you're thinking about so many different backgrounds, disciplines. And I think the, the biggest thing that I, I took from Batten was being able to be an advocate for whoever you're serving, whatever you're focused on in a, um, in a space where people are thinking are coming with different perspective, right? So if I'm, you know, talking about, if I am thinking about, um, uh, you know, like students during COVID, Right, like I'm, I'm now thinking. Okay, what are their needs? Um, kind of how, how do we, um, you know, provide like solutions and support to students during COVID? But I might be in a space where people are not coming from a social work perspective, uh, but from others. So I think that was the biggest kind of experience or skill that I took away from my time at that. One thing I would add as well is just the critical thinking skills that you begin to develop in Batten. And I remember in my interviews with PricewaterhouseCoopers following um, Batten, they were really impressed with my ability to speak to the experiences that came with the coursework. And so some of the, um, you know, big group projects that we'd be working on, um, I think of Professor Martin's policy implementation class and um, and the, the skills that we gained in really applying public policy to real world problems and being able to speak to that um, was critical as well as um, the outside of the classroom experiences and the relationships that you begin to develop with your classmates who um, just continue to be lifelong friends. Um, I saw we have a question from Ellen, which I'm happy to respond to unless um, others want to weigh in on this first. Well, why don't you start, Grace? Okay, so um, work-life balance, I think is something that is an ongoing um, challenge and question and, and what works in one period of life doesn't necessarily work in others is what I've found. Um, and I think that particularly in working from home, there have to be different strategies of how you separate your work from your life when your work is centrally located in the living room of your life. <laughs> um, but for me, what that means is um, as much as possible, protecting my weekends and evening hours with my friends and family, um, 
living in Colorado, I have the luxury of being an hour drive from mountains. And so sometimes the best way to disconnect is truly to go somewhere where there's no self-service and no one can find me um, for a backpacking trip. Um, but I think it's also, I found just the routine and structure of a day. Um, and I'll add to that, um, since I know we're almost at time, some advice that I would have is to find the why in your work and to really focus on um, kind of the meaning behind what you're doing and the impact you're having on others. And that makes the work that sometimes infringes on your life a little um, easier. And I've especially found that over the past year of, of really um, searching for that impact in my work to um, kind of find the, the energy to keep going and definitely PTO. <laughs> I can jump in. Um, so definitely I try my best to like uh, preserve my time. If I'm not working, I shut off and I really try disconnecting with family and friends. Um, but another thing that um, I think I realized over the past year is um, thinking about kind of the content I'm, I'm like um, absorbing uh, when it comes to like TV and reading materials. I try my best to like read and watch fun, you know, fun things that take me out of like the social issues that I am constantly dealing with on a, like, you know, uh, uh, during the day. So, and I, I tried to change up my like watching and reading material. Um, so I, I take kind of a mental break and space away. Well, we are just about at the end of our hour together. I want to, uh, thank our panelists. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for, for being with us today. It's great to see you. This, of course, is the end of this conversation, but hopefully it's not the end of conversations. I, I suspect people will, may reach out to you on the basis of, of this hour. And please know you're always welcome and warmly invited back here, even by Zoom or, or back to Garrett Hall in the Great Hall. Um, it's great to see you and to know you're out there doing good work. So thank you for that. And thank you for kicking off this public service week at UVA. Uh, I invite everyone here to check out our website. We have events happening every single day this week. Um, and I hope to see more of you. So with that, let me thank you. Wish you well. Keep, hope you stay safe and healthy. Get vaccinated soon. And keep doing the good work in the world. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.